In this session, we will cover the essential ECG features of cardiac chamber enlargement and hypertrophy. Chamber enlargement and hypertrophy, as far as the ECG is concerned, are two closely related entities because findings in either may overlap. But at the pathological level, enlargement means dilatation or an increase in size or volume of the chamber, whereas hypertrophy means an increase in muscle mass. Either way, either of these conditions would basically result in an increase in the amplitude and or duration of the electrical signal, which pertains to that particular cardiac chamber. So we really have four chambers to consider as far as discussing chamber enlargement or hypertrophy is concerned. They are both the ventricles, the left ventricle and the right ventricle, and the two atria. Let's take up ventricular hypertrophy first. So, as we said, an increase in the amplitude and duration of the signal pertaining to the chamber. So, the first thing which comes to mind is an increase in QRS voltage. So, which leads would show an increase in QRS voltage? That obviously would depend on which chamber is enlarged or which chamber is hypertrophy. So, LVH or left ventricular hypertrophy would be more likely to cause an increase in the QRS voltage positive direction in the lateral leads, namely from V4 to V6, whereas right ventricular hypertrophy or RVH would lead to an increase in the dominance of positive deflection in the right-sided leads, namely V1 to V2. The second thing ventricular hypertrophy often does it is causes a shift in the frontal plane QRS axis. And again, with left ventricular hypertrophy, there would be a shift in axis to the left, and with right ventricular hypertrophy, there would be a right axis deviation. Now, almost always you'll find in a lot of conditions that depolarization abnormalities are often accompanied by repolarization abnormalities. One of the uh, previous examples you could recollect is a myocardial infarction where you find typically both depolarization and repolarization abnormalities. So similarly, ventricular hypertrophy often, other than increasing the QRS uh, complex, also causes STT changes, which are repolarization changes. And it can also cause an increase in QRS duration, though this increase is generally of a small magnitude and doesn't reach the QRS duration to the extent caused by, for example, uh, conduction abnormalities such as bundle branch blocks. So here's a pictorial representation to understand how LVH and RVH would basically impact the ECG. So if you look at the normal situation, the LV is still the more bulkier ventricle and therefore you, you have a net QRS vector going downwards and to the left. So normally you do have a dominance of a S wave in lead V1 and a dominance of R wave in lead V6. Now with LVH where the left ventricular muscle mass is increased, these changes would be further exaggerated. So you would have deep S waves in V1 and V2 and tall R waves in V5 and V6. Whereas with RVH, this relationship can be fundamentally altered because as the RV mass increases and starts predominating, then you start getting tall R waves in V1 and significant S waves in the lateral leads of V6. So based on the increase in the amplitude of the QRS, different voltage criteria have been proposed to diagnose LVH or RVH from the ECG. Now, all of these voltage criteria generally have low sensitivity and relatively higher specificity. The reason is that voltage on the ECG can be affected by factors other than hypertrophy. A person's body habitus, the thickness of the chest wall, the presence of effusions in the chest, obesity, all of these will basically influence the distance between the cardiac muscle and the surface of the chest from where the ECG is being recorded. And therefore, the sensitivity is not very good for all of these voltage criteria. Let's consider some of the LVH voltage criteria. The most commonly used one is the sokolov leon criterion. Basically, what it is, is that it takes the sum of the S wave in V1 or V2 combines it with the R wave in either V5 or V6. And if this sum exceeds 35 millimeters, then it's considered to be diagnostic of LVH. The other sokolov leon criterion is taking the R wave alone in lead AVL. And if it exceeds 11 millimeters, then it is considered diagnostic of LVH. So the sensitivity of this criterion is about 20% and the specificity is about 85%. 
Another very popularly used voltage criteria is the coronal criteria. Now this combines S wave in V3 plus R in AVL and this is gender specific in that and if it exceeds 28 millimeters in men or 20 millimeter in women, it is considered diagnostic of LVH. A further refinement or improvement to the coronal criteria is what is called the coronal voltage duration product. Now here it takes the same voltage that is S in V3 plus R in AVL but it now multiplies it with the QRS duration. So remember we said that ventricular hypertrophy can also affect the QRS duration because the increased amount of ventricular muscle takes a little longer time to depolarize as compared to a normal muscle mass. So when we take multiply the voltage with the duration, a cutoff of 2, 4, 3, 6 millimeter second is considered to be diagnostic of LVH. Now the coronal voltage duration product is sometimes considered to be one of the best voltage indices because it has relatively the best combination of sensitivity and specificity among the voltage criteria. Some of the other voltage criteria which are used with LVH include the presence of an R in left precordial leads of more than 25 millimeter or conversely, the S in a right precordial lead exceeding 25 millimeter. Some people use the combination of R in lead 1 and S in lead 3 to exceed 25 millimeter or an isolated R in lead AVF exceeding 20 millimeter. So all of these are basically reflecting the increased muscle mass. Now accompanying these increases in QRS amplitude, you would find concomitant STT changes. Now previously these STT changes were classically labeled as the straight rate pattern or the pressure overload pattern. These terms are uh, kind of considered a little outdated now but they are still quite commonly used so it's worthwhile being familiar with them. What does the so-called strain pattern mean? What you find is that there is a combination of downsloping ST depression with asymmetric T wave inversion in left sided leads, classically in LVH. Now conversely, on the right sided leads, you can find a slight ST elevation and this ST elevation is up concave in appearance generally. If you recollect, the other ominous condition which is ST elevation MI typically causes up concave, up convex, uh, sorry, ST elevations, whereas this typically causes up concave ST elevations. Now this has been classically called the pressure overload pattern because it's often found in conditions such as aortic stenosis which causes an increase in the left ventricular pressure. There is also another pattern in LVH which is called the volume overload pattern, for example classically found in conditions such as aortic regurgitation. Here instead of finding inverted T waves, you find tall upright T waves in the lateral leads such as 1, AVL, V5 and V6 and concomitantly you have narrow deep Q waves present in those leads and this is sometimes called the volume overload pattern when it, when it accompanies the voltage criteria for LBH. Other than an increase in QRS voltage, the other ECG changes that you might encounter in LBH would include axis deviation to the left, presence of accompanying left atrial enlargement, we will discuss the criteria for that shortly, and presence of slight QT prolongation because repolarization also takes a little longer. So this ECG shows you the presence of LVH with strain pattern. You can see in the right sided leads V1 and V2, there is pretty deep S waves, they are exaggerated more than normal and conversely in V5 and V6 you can see the tall pause R waves and if you add up the sum of the S and the R it would exceed the 35 millimeter cutoff for the sokolov leon criterion. And you can also see the down sloping ST depression and asymmetric T wave inversion in the lateral leads. Now putting all these uh, different findings of LVH together, a point score system was evolved because no single criterion might have adequate sensitivity and specificity. So the Romhent ST score system was developed putting together all these different findings and giving points to each one of them so that we can arrive at a more potentially more objective diagnosis. So it incorporates uh, voltage as you can see presence of any R or S in limb leads exceeding 20 millimeter or presence of an S in right sided precordial leads exceeding 25 millimeter or presence of an R in V5 and V6 exceeding 25 millimeter all of these gets any of these gets three points. Presence of STT changes the so called strain pattern would get 
three points, but if the patient is taking digoxin for some reason, it gets only one point because digoxin by itself can induce some of these ST changes. Presence of left atrial enlargement gets three points. Presence of left axis deviation gets two points. And prolongation of the QRS duration about 90 milliseconds or an RV, RV peak time in lateral meets exceeding 50 milliseconds gets one point. So essentially you put all these abnormalities together and if there are five points or more, it's considered to be definite LVH. If it's four points, it's considered to be probable LVH.